The reading this morning is from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9 and 43. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise pay attention to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. And one more word of thanks to the choir. Thank you for that. Appalachian Lord's Prayer. And then that opening prayer called a prayer is from South Africa. Those words of it is not true and it is true, that cadence. And imagine, you know, the depths of those words coming from a situation as South Africans have found themselves in the years. And so we bring in all these words of wisdom from across the world into our service this morning. And we bring in a psalm as well. I've told you all that I am doing a summer series on Old Testament readings. We did Hosea last week, and I just didn't want to do two Hoseas. I didn't want to do something different every week. And so the psalm was the only choice for Old Testament, for the lectionary. And so I thought, well, you know, normally I don't do psalms. Normally psalms aren't preached upon. Maybe Psalm 23 at, at a memorial service but normally they're reduced to maybe a call to worship or some kind of prayer thing. But today it's the focus of a message. Psalm 107. A lot to say, so let's get to it right now. We'll start with a prayer, so let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you bring us news of your love every morning how we need to hear that news this very morning. So be with us in our eyes and our seeing, our ears and our hearing, our lives and our living this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have attended a lot of church conferences like I have, inevitably there'll be a worship leader or someone who opens the conference, a very cheerful sort, who gets us going in the morning, and he will say this, or he, it's been a he in my experience, but he or she will say this. God is good all the time. And then that person says, all the time, and you respond, so God is good all the time. And I'm tired by the time that opening starts because he was too energetic and too, too excited about this whole thing and I'm wondering then, but is God good all the time? I mean, often, you know, I read the news. I, I know what's going on in the world. If God is good all the time, then what's going on in Ukraine? How can that happen? If God is good all the time, why are we still dealing with COVID? If God is good all the time, what about those fires in Kentucky right now? You know, it just makes me think, uh, has the church been a little too naive, maybe, or a little too glossing over a lot of things, going right from God is good to all the time? I'm thinking maybe some of the time it works pretty good. Some of the time, maybe on a Sunday morning, we're doing okay, and I love the music and being with all of you, but all the time, are you kidding me? Uh, and so you see what's going through my mind every conference I go to when it starts off with, God is good. Thank you very much. Okay, so 
What do we do with this? You know, for 38 years being a pastor, what I've done with this is trying to make church good all the time, trying to make worship as good as possible. I, I admitted to some people that I've been waiting 38 years for my perfect sermon. I thought for sure by now I would have given at least one perfect sermon. And that maybe not even focus on me. Maybe, maybe one perfect worship service. Ever been to one where everything just worked out well? I, I still go back to, I think, 2006. Back in Lyndhurst, Ohio, my previous church before San, uh, Santa Fe. And, and everything worked out, that service. Maybe you were there. Maybe you remember that, where we had a saxophonist who was a relative of a relative of a friend of a member who came and, and did a closing with just a closer walk with me. And he was so good, he had played for President Clinton and thought that was pretty good. You know, we had that. And every hymn was just, just the perfect hymn for that moment in the service. And the place was packed. It's a huge sanctuary. The place was packed. At least my eyes saw that it was packed. There may have been a few little places back in the back, but we couldn't do anything wrong. I have no idea if it was my perfect sermon, but I don't think people cared because everything else is going so well. And we had a young family there, and they came up afterward. For the first time, they came, and they said, Wow, boy, we're coming back for this. This is fantastic, just what we're looking for. They came back the next week. You know what happened the next week? Well, the saxophonist wasn't there. The hymns weren't quite catching the moment. About half the people were there from the week before. I don't know what I said, but it was not memorable. And I never saw them again. You know, we always worry about the perfect this and that, the perfect, we want to look perfect, we want to do things perfectly. I think the church got caught in, up into that. I sure did back then, thinking I, I have a new way of, of doing church, and I thought for one Sunday I had reached it. It would be that way ever since. It never was. Have we fallen into that trap, maybe a few of us at least, of trying to kind of skirt over all the issues of the world, all the things that don't work out right, Oh, the mistakes in the bulletin, you know, you may find one or so and used to fret over that. Uh, but, you know, maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're not feeling we're faithful enough if we even talk about the negative things that are going on and so forth. There's something going on there that is a little uneasy for me. Even, and I must tell you this, I mean, I could gloss this over and not even share this with you. I, I did write about it last week in my letter to the saints, but just so you all know that even things happen here at the church building. A, a week ago, Thursday night or Friday, we discovered that there's a bullet hole in a window in the CDC, our preschool. May have happened during the night. May have happened when the kids were all gone. No one has heard. No one ever heard the sound of it, but Someone noticed a, a hole, and then we brought a window person in to fix it on Monday, and he said, it's not a child. This is not a child throwing something at the window. This is a bullet from outside. Someone shot at the church building across the street in the convention center corner to the right of that tree closest to the corner. I say that because I want to make sure we all know that that happened. It's not a perfect world out there. You know, this is not a perfect church in a perfect community. We know that. But we often try to hide the fact. It could just have been a random bullet, a one-off, a, you know, we don't have any idea. Nothing's happened since. The police aren't too concerned about it, but they're patrolling a little bit more around here, at least for a little while, just to get that out in the open. Never happened before. I never had a bullet hit a, by one of the churches I served before. We'll keep you informed if anything else comes up, but not sure it will. 
Oh, I wish that didn't happen. I wish we had a, a, a place that didn't have bullet holes in it. I wish we had a community that didn't have violence. I wish we had a, you know, a world where God is good all the time and we knew it. Well, our scripture lesson this morning, the first verse starts us on that path. It says things like, you know, give thanks to God, God is good, and God's love endures forever. God is good all the time, kind of an idea. And we can look at that scripture, that, that, that psalm, and think that, yeah, that's the psalmist. You know, where in the world is this psalmist coming from? Doesn't the psalmist know the pain of a world around us? Doesn't the psalmist know that we go through things every day as human beings? For God to be looked at that way by a psalmist is always God's love endures forever. Maybe, maybe for an afternoon, but God's love might not endure in the evening time in our lives. So whenever I get a little perplexed, confused, worried about an issue, I either go to the prophets, I go to Jesus, or I go to one of these amazing, brilliant thinkers in our world today. And so I chose the latter this time, a brilliant thinker in our world today by the name of Walter Brueggemann. Anyone, who knows Walter Brueggemann? Okay, about seven of you. Thank you. I hope more and more people know the name. He's been around for decades. He's a retired pastor from Columbia Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. He was out in Santa Fe when I first came here to have a little group gathering of clergy and just a brilliant, wonderful man. And, and I had a book about this. Well, I'll show it to you. This book called The Spirituality of the Psalms, this wide. A lot of people write volumes, and the really good ones write something that you can understand in, in about 60 pages. And Walter Brueggemann is one of these people that can really get to the point. I had this book on my shelf for 38 years. Never looked at it until this past week when I said, I have nothing on this psalm. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and Walter Brueggemann opened my eyes to what psalms are all about. They deal with everything in life. They deal with the good things, the bad things, the unspeakable things. They, they deal with the joys that, that come in the morning. One of the psalms says that. They deal with Memorial services, even though Psalm 23 wasn't written for a memorial service, we often use it then. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise. All these psalms for every part of living, and there's a reason for it. The psalmists are telling us that God is present in every sphere of life. There's no place that God isn't. There's no words that we can say that are beyond what God might hear. Imagine that. There's no window that's been shot out that God hasn't seen already. There's no hospital bed that God has not been beside when someone's passing away. There's no cry that God hasn't heard. This is all in the Psalms. And what Brueggemann says is, that there's a movement in these psalms, that there's three movements. And the first is orientation. It just means we have found ourselves in a world we hope will be fair and we can trust it and things are going well and we can thank God for that. And many psalms start out talking about that, like ours did. God's love endures forever. But we all know that life doesn't work that way doesn't stay that way, that we are in a great time of disorientation. That's the second part of what Psalms do. They help us identify that disorientation. I've never been in a time, probably you haven't either, of disorientation in the world. Nothing seems to work anymore. Nothing we can count on anymore. You know, whatever you might be feeling about COVID and violence and go down the, your own list, we're disoriented, and some speak about that. And Brueggemann says, 
if you face the darkness that the Psalms face, that God faces, when you do that, you begin to see something different. You, be, you begin to know that you aren't alone in the darkness, that you can bring up any questions that you need to in the darkness, and God is there to listen and to be with you. That this, this orientation can begin to change, and at some point, that third thing happens. New orientation is what Brueggemann says, but it's really when God breaks into your life when you don't think anything is going to work out well, when you think there's no way out, that somehow something breaks in, and all of a sudden you see life differently. This is what the Psalms can do and have done for centuries, Brueggemann says. It takes us where we are, where we hope to be, where it really isn't reality, and then goes counterculture and says, but live into the disorientation, and by doing so, you begin to get reoriented to a new way of understanding the world. And it never goes just nice and easy, one to the next, and then we're good and stay that way. It's always back and forth, and you think you're here, new orientation, and then all of a sudden, you're back in disorientation again. It's always a movement, but that's true to what life is like. A good friend of ours from Ohio dealt with a lot of alcoholism. He woke up, and his worst day was knowing that he was at the bottom of, of his life. There was nowhere to go except up. And that's how it often happens when people change. He said that that day was his worst day and his best day because he knew that he had to have a new orientation and that somehow something broke into his life and that this new orientation happened to him. And some 30 years later, he's still good in helping others. We know people don't always get that way and some people we lose through addiction, through other things that happen in life. But there's a sense though of that old ways changing into new ways. Psalms do that to us. Just a few more words. Look at this Psalm 107. You may have it in front of you in the bulletin. But after that first phrase or so, we go into disorientation. The psalmist talks about how God gathers people from everywhere, east and west, north and south. No one's left out, and he gathers them, and they're the ones that have been suffering so much, like maybe us, uh, of being hungry and thirsty for something more in life, of, of being in desert places, that wilderness place where there's nothing there for us, and there's no safety or, or food or sustenance, of being, well, our, fo our, our soul faints, it says. But then there's a change between, it's really verses 5 and 6, from that, where that soul faints to, I cried to the Lord, and God heard me, and then begins to think of that new orientation of how God is with that person. I hope we cry enough here. I hope we feel comfortable enough to come to church and not always worry about looking good, but to be able to share who we are and what we're going through, to cry out if we need to, because that's how the psalmist realized that God is with him or her. He or she cried. And I would say we can say things to one another and share a conversation. At the first service, we do that a lot, in the, in, and I've done that some here, where we say things in the depths of our soul, perhaps, and how, I don't know, comforting or how it releases something that we know we can trust someone to hear that. Oh, and I love this part. Psalms are meant to be sung. I wish I knew the tune, right? But we have chants, and you know, we have other ways that we try to figure out to get some, to some of that beautiful, deep, soulful music that rises up out of the depths of our souls, and we lift it to the world, how singing can bring that sense of a new understanding of who God is. That's why we sing. I don't think many people have a chance to sing enough with somebody else and you hear their voices next to you, like a choir, 
How many people are part of choir? I'm not sure. You may be part out in the community, but our choir gets to hear this all the time. But do you get to sing more than once a week when you come to church? Maybe not when you hear other voices. And maybe praying. I cry, I say, I sing, I pray. Maybe praying is so important. Those are all prayers in the Psalms. I cry out to you, God. You see, the psalmist is onto something. Open yourself up to God. And if you don't really know if there's a God out there to open yourself up to, well, the psalmist, even in this story, in, the, in these verses that the lectionary picked out, the lectionary people picked out, they skipped over verses 10 through 42 to what you have in that last verse is 43. We don't have the page numbers in there, but trust me. What does it say there? I don't know what happened 10 through 42, but I know what happened in 43 because they picked it up for us. And it says, you know, like you're invited to choose. Choose understanding that maybe God's love endures forever. That God is good all the time. That we don't really realize it sometimes, but maybe God is there when you are alone all the time. God is there. When you are watching someone pass away, God is there. When you see a bullet hole in a window, God is there. And go right down your life. And you can choose to look at life that way. And so I, I apologize if I made light of that phrase to start out conferences. Because maybe after looking at Psalm 107, I understand it better. Because that psalmist knew the depths of living all the pain and sorrow and the joy. So much so that someone stands up in front of other people and starts something new and says, God is good. God is good all the time. All the time. All the time. Amen.